We leave for Milan. Actually, this is a long day. We're going to be heading all the way down to the Italian Riviera in Portofino later in the day. But along the way, we're going to stop in Milan for about six hours and have a stroll about this great industrial and artistic city. The train station is the second largest train station in all of Europe. It's a marble palace based on one of the ancient Roman Basilica bathhouses. And there's convenient subway service from the central train station right into the main part of downtown Milan. Here's our Hawaii group trying to figure out the subway line. It's a very modern and very clean and efficient subway. And within about 10 minutes, you go the five stops from the main train station to the Duomo. We've left our baggage back in the main storage room at the train station, so we're free to just walk around the city for about six hours and come along with us and you'll be amazed at how much we can see in Milan in a six-hour period. Although it's a very big city, the attractions for the tourist are fairly limited to the central downtown area. The great cathedral, the galleria, the shopping malls, the Scala Opera House, and the restaurants, and you'll see it all in this program as we have a look around through Milano. The Galleria. Merging from the subway at the Duomo station, right away you see some of the important historical monuments, especially the Milan Cathedral. This is the finest example of northern Gothic architecture in all of Italy, and they say that it's the largest Gothic cathedral in the world. We'll be going up on the roof to have a stroll through this forest of marble spires. It's an amazing sight. You can take an elevator up to the rooftop and then walk around in one of the largest Gothic sculpture gardens to be found any place in the world. And from here you get a commanding view of the city of Milan. Few churches in Italy underwent such a slow, complex building process as Milan's cathedral. In addition, putting up such a gigantic monument involved not only Lombardy, but actually all of Italy. And they've actually built it with staircases integrated within the Gothic architecture so that you're free to walk all over it. It was in fact through the cathedral that the high Gothic style from north of the Alps made its way down to Milan and henceforth influenced the entire country. However, this is the only purely northern Gothic structure anywhere to be found in Italy. Progress in construction was painstakingly slow. Work actually went on throughout five centuries, although the original Gothic style was never abandoned. The cathedral dedicated to Mary was actually begun in 1387 over the site of a ninth century basilica of Santa Maria Maggiore. The structure is built entirely of marble and is so incredibly strong that you can walk right on the top of the roof of the nave, as we're doing here. Ceilings of cathedrals have always been vulnerable places, open to fire and destruction from various natural causes as well, but not the Milan Cathedral. This is one of the strongest buildings ever constructed. The typical Gothic schemes in the hands of the Italian architects lost much of their northern flavor and acquired a more typically Italian feeling. In 1389, the main architect was dismissed and Nicola di Bonaventura was summoned from Paris. Nicola designed the huge pierced windows of the apse upon his arrival in 1389, but he too was dismissed in 1390. Italian and foreign master craftsmen followed one upon the next. Among them we may cite the Germans Johann from Freiburg and Heinrich Parler from Gmünden, Ulrich from Füssingen, Hans von Wernock, and the Italians Bernardo da Venezia, Gabriele Sternaloco, Marco da Corona, and Giovanni de Grassi. From 1392 on, the work on the cathedral was supervised exclusively by Italian masters who left their imprint in the use of the flowery Gothic style known for its flamboyant decorative patterns. See the gargoyles functioning as rain spouts here, little spikes to keep the pigeons off. The capitals and vaultings and terraces were primarily designed after 1400. 
Work went on at such a fast pace that by 1418 the main altar was consecrated. The 15th century Milanese architecture and thus also that of the cathedral was strongly influenced by three generations of the Solari family. Many decorative touches were added later in the 16th and 17th century and here we see some examples of Baroque sculpture and even today workmen are continually building and rebuilding the Gothic decorative elements. There's been a lot of pollution in Milan during the last 200 years of the industrial age and therefore much of the original stonework has crumbled and decayed so there's a constant ongoing stream of restoration work which seems to be nearly complete. There was only this one scaffolding left on the very topmost spire of the cathedral. These Gothic spires on the facade were originally constructed in the early 1500s. The great spire in the center of the church was erected in the late 1700s and the facade was constructed in the early 1800s. So work went on for hundreds of years and continued right up through the 19th century during which time the spires and the towers with stairways inside were completed. You can see the mountains in the distance through the hazy air of Milan. It's actually a fairly clear day today and some other historic landmarks located just nearby. Beyond we see this conical topped brown brick tower of San Gotardo in Corte and the old rooftops of Palazzo Reale. Back up on top of the spires, we see even more Gothic ornamentation. When the cathedral facade had finally been completed in the mid-19th century, it was then decided to decorate the roof with these profusion of spires and pinnacles and statuary in keeping with the overall Gothic style. At the top, we have the statue of the Madonna. The spires represent a fitting conclusion to the centuries-long project and are perhaps the most distinctive characteristic of the whole building. There are over 2,000 individual Gothic pinnacles up on the roof and 158 steps that will lead you back down to the ground level. Or if you'd rather, there's an elevator that'll take you most of the way. These walkways are quite narrow, so when a tour group comes along, you just have to stop and wait your turn. <laughs> Gliding along past these ornamented railings, we enjoy our final views from the rooftop and soon find ourselves inside the main cathedral itself. Every place you look, from the floor to the ceiling, you're surrounded by immense beauty. This is the second largest church in the world, after St. Peter's in Rome. It's the largest Gothic cathedral to be found anywhere, and the vast space gives you a feeling of calmness, and peacefulness and tranquility. The plan consists of lofty double aisles and transepts terminated with a circlet of columns in the French manner, but enclosed in a German polygonal apse, while there is an amazingly high dome 225 feet high above the ground. In the nave there's a forest of huge columns 60 feet high, surrounded by shafts and surmounted by enormous capitals 20 feet in height. The floor is glistening marble, one of the shiniest floors you'll find in any cathedral anywhere in the world. The interior is vast, lofty, and imposing with fine perspective views. Here at the rear section of the church we find that the apse and the ambulatory are the most genuinely gothic part of the whole cathedral. The imposing apse is emphasized by the enormous buttress spanning three huge windows designed by Filippino degli Organi. They were created during the 15th century and primarily depict scenes from the Old Testament. People of the medieval days were illiterate and thus the stained glass windows were used for didactic purposes to teach them about the lessons of the Bible. Our group from Hawaii has never seen anything quite like this at home so it's really an overwhelming experience. The overall dimensions of the cathedral are enormous. It measures 515 feet long by 302 feet wide and soars 585 feet into the air. 
If you listen hard, you can hear the building sing. The facade of the church on the exterior is also very impressive. It continues the monumental scale 160 feet high and 200 feet wide, dripping with statues from the Baroque and Gothic period from the 16th through the 18th century. And out front, we can buy our souvenir booklet. Upon leaving the cathedral, we look at the Piazza del Duomo with its equestrian statue of Victorio Emmanuel II, and something really important. So much for the world's second largest church, here's something of greater significance yet the world's first large shopping mall, the famous Galleria of Milano, lorded over by these old-fashioned looking policemen who are ready to maintain order and discipline and be sure that the shoppers have a peaceful place for their activities. This is one of the finest expressions of the early industrial age architecture with the welding of steel and glass together forming this giant dome and covered arcade. Built in the 1860s, it's not the world's first covered shopping mall. The Burlington Arcade in London might lay claim to that distinction in 1820. However, here we are after the Crystal Palace of 1850 in London, finding the ultimate expression of the covered shopping gallery in the Galleria of Milano. It was designed by Giuseppe Mignoni and built with English finance and epitomizes the outstanding contribution of the first industrial age to urban architecture. As Karl Marx put it a decade earlier, the bourgeoisie has accomplished wonders far surpassing Egyptian pyramids, Roman aqueducts, and Gothic cathedrals. In a word, it creates a world after its own image. And even a hundred years later, the space still adapts itself to modern needs. Here we see a multimedia giant video display and surrounded by some of the most expensive boutiques in the city. The finest jewelry shops and watch stores are located here. You have a great selection of books from various bookstores, map shops, clothing stores. There's banks where you can change your money and there's a lot of cafes where you can just sit down and pass the time of day with a pot of tea perhaps or a gourmet lunch. This venerable arcade provides a center for urbane living, both comfortable and magnificent, that has not been surpassed. Today, this glassed-in street is a center for both cultural and mundane activities that's a real tribute to the extraordinary genius and technical skill of the architects of 100 years ago. It's simply one of the finest urban spaces any place in the world. It's been copied in city after city, there's another great Galleria in Naples. There's another great Galleria in Rome. They even have a fast food hamburger joint where we catch our Hawaii group enjoying an American meal. This little restaurant also has the cleanest restrooms ever found in Italy. It's right at the crossing of the Galleria. Refreshed and fortified with our fix of French fries, we now venture forth into the streets of Milan. We've got about five hours to walk around the city and enjoy some of its shopping treats and other historical monuments, so we'll devote the rest of our program to the scenic highlights of this great center of industry and fashion and commerce. A large part of the central city is devoted to the pedestrian. There's always the huge newsstands and more covered gallerias on the little side streets. They've continued the theme of the Great Galleria throughout the center of the city. So no cars are allowed in this very pleasant pedestrian zone. The dazzling mosaic of marble sidewalk reminds you that you're in one of the world's capitals of design. And right in the heart of Milan, we find this stately neoclassical church of San Carlo al Corso. The building was put up between 1832 and 1847, and the distinctive vaulted dome was built in 1844. Continuing along the pedestrian Corso Porto Venezia, we soon come to a typical fast food cafe. Amico is a chain that you'll find throughout the city, 
And you see here the prices are quite reasonable, ranging from $3 on up to $5 for a typical sandwich or a salad. The food here is affordable, tasty, fast and easy. You just walk in and point at what you want. You go over to the cashier and pay for it and come back with your ticket. And you can stand up at the front counter if you wish to just have a meal on your feet. Or you can sit down in the back room and pay a little bit more money, spend a little bit more time with your meal. Either way, it's a refreshing pick-me-up on your tour of Milan. Lunch Italian style. Notice here they're all standing in line at the cashier. As typical of all the cafes in Italy and throughout the continent, you pay your money to the cashier and hand the ticket to the food clerk. They don't mix money and food here. Continuing along the way, we come to another very charming little pedestrian street. This is a street with some high fashion boutiques on it. Via del Spiga is very pleasant for once again there's no automobiles allowed so it makes for some fine window shopping even on a Sunday when all the stores are actually closed. It's a lot cheaper to be walking on such a day. Milan is one of the most elegant shopping venues in the world with the tradition of Bond Street of London, the chic of Faubourg Saint Honoré from Paris and the glitz of Beverly Hills. Milan is Italy's New York. It's the capital of fashion and it certainly is a rival to Paris as the world center of high fashion. No fashion designer or stylist or interior decorator or architect has made it until he has made it in Milan. They really have a fine sense of style. If you've heard of the high fashion boutiques of Milan and looked forward to finding them, this is where you'll see them on Via della Spiga and the nearby Via San Andrea and particularly via Monte Napoleone and the little side streets that come off of this main boulevard. Milan is a window shopper's paradise with each store vying with the next to see whose wares are displayed with the most pizzazz. And it's quite interesting just to observe the people walking along these streets. They're quite elegantly attired. And even the policemen have that fine sense of style as we've seen earlier. The most frequent in parts of Milan are right in the heart of the city here. Along with the Galleria near the cathedral, the Milanese come to talk or read in the various cafes, and fashionable shops are also to be found on the Corso Vittorio Emanuele and the Corso Venezia. And there's a lot of antique shops as well as the high fashion boutiques. There are some inexpensive little cafes in the neighborhood, delicatessen type stores with takeout foods, and there are just a few small elegant restaurants scattered through this neighborhood, perhaps one every three blocks, so they might be a little hard to find. But one of the nicest ways to find good local restaurants is simply to ask people. Stop people on the street, especially if they're not in a big hurry, and ask directions. Uh, could you tell me where there's a fine restaurant? And you'll get into some interesting conversations that way. Now here's a little fashion shoot on the streets of Milan. You know this city is a world fashion capital and so you find a lot of the trade at work here. There's photographers and models working right on the streets of Milan, shooting a magazine spread and watch this interesting way they try and capture the feeling of motion for the still photographer. It's right on the daily streets. A few people stop and take notice. A few tourists with their cameras stop and take pictures, but otherwise People just walk by and ignore. This is a fact of everyday life in Milan. High fashion. Looks like they're practicing for a relay race. Set amidst the glorious architecture of the city. Milan is very much a center of business and trade. It's so fascinating to see the mix of fantasy and reality that the tourist always runs into in Italy. The high fashion, ultra modern, along with the antique and the ancient, the world of business and finance mixed in with the tourist attractions of the visitor. Here's some antique trolleys still running through the center of town, running into the ancient wall, the old Roman wall that still surrounds large parts of the city. 
Milan has always played a very important role in the economy and in the politics of the region. Milan is probably of Celtic origin originally, thousands of years ago, but it was the Romans who really subdued the city in the second century BC. And then it became very important to the Roman Empire starting in the year 305, because at that time it became the capital of the Roman Empire itself. When the emperors moved out of the city of Rome, they moved into Milan and stayed there for a hundred years from 300 till 400 AD. And the most important event that happened during that time was the proclamation of the Edict of Milan by the Emperor Constantine. This took place in the year 312, and it officially legalized the Christian religion. For the first time, the government of Rome recognized the religion of Christ and the proclamation was made in a church here that's still standing and just a little bit later in the program we'll be visiting that church San Ambrogio but for now we're still walking down through the fashion center of the city great place for leather goods especially shoes handbags belts and purses high fashion gear of all sorts and it's not all super expensive you can actually find sales at the end of every season there's big clearances and closeouts we're continuing our walk now down Via Manzoni, and this appears to be the liveliest and busiest of all the commercial shopping streets, and yet you can poke your head down these little alleyways into the beautiful arcades and gardens behind the palaces. There's little oases of tranquility just right off of the main street. Place for cats to spend their time of day and surrounded by fences so they're protected from the city. This was a 17th century row of palaces that's been converted into the shops and restaurants that we find today on the main, very busy street of Via Manzoni. Protected cloisters and beautiful gardens, marvelous neoclassical architecture all around you. It's one of the fine spots of Milan. And there's more quiet little side streets just off the main busy boulevard. You're watching the Hawaii Geographic Society's trip to Italy. We're in Milan. We've been traveling from Rome up to Florence and Venice up to the Lake Country. And now we're in Milan heading for the famous Opera House of the Scala, perhaps the most famous opera house in the world. The theater was constructed in 1776, and it's been conducting operas ever since. Although it was hit by a big bomb during World War II, it's been rebuilt in the fine old Baroque style. And you're allowed to go inside almost any day and have a look. There's a small museum that's part of the Scala, and you pay your admission to the museum, and it includes admission to the theater itself just to have a look at this fine specimen of the theater. It seats 3,000 people, and it has perfect acoustics. The most famous, and the best opera house any place in the world. Works by Rossini and Donizetti and Bellini and Verdi and Puccini were first premiered here. From the beginning of this century, its reputation was upheld by the legendary figure of Toscanini. This interior stands out for its uncluttered elegance, especially if you compare it to the typical over-stuccoed theater in vogue in the 18th century. And attached to it is the Museum of the Scala. This museum was founded at the turn of the century, and its collections are an invaluable document relating not just to theater in Milan, but also to the development of theater in Italy and the world over from its birth up to the present day. Step by step, we can trace here the history of drama from the Greek statues to the masks of ancient Rome to the portraits of the performers in Louis XIV's court right up through the opera singers of the 20th century. The museum is open from 9 in the morning till 11.30 in the morning, closes for lunch, and then again it's open from 2 until 5. And it memorializes, perhaps above all, the great genius Verdi, who premiered many of his great operas here at the Scala. After a beautiful exhibit, we hop in our taxi and continue on across town. 
It's a fairly big city, so you might not be able to walk every place, especially if you just have a day in Milan, as we have in our program here today. We're crossing town to look at the most historic church in the city, San Ambrogio. There are several important art museums in Milan that you might like to visit here. There's the Castello Sforzesco with its archaeological and art historical collections. It contains some superb paintings by Mantegna and Bellini, and the sculpture collection will come as a surprise for it includes the final masterpiece by Michelangelo, his last Pietà. Even more important is the Brera Picture Gallery with works by Tintoretto and Mantegna, Bramante, Raphael, and a masterpiece by Piero della Francesca. That's located right in the heart of Old Milan on Via Brera. We're just now arriving at the Basilica of Sant'Ambrogio, which was built back in the fourth century, making this perhaps the oldest Romanesque church in the world. It created the Lombard style of the Romanesque Basilica. The portico was designed by Bramante much later, and the interior shows some of the hallmarks of the early Romanesque period. It's believed these cross vaulted ribs are the first ever built, and this pulpit was reconstituted from fragments of the 11th century and early 12th century, saved after the vault collapsed in 1196, and it's one of the most remarkable Romanesque monuments known. Beneath it is a Roman Paleo-Christian sarcophagus from the 4th century. This church is very much a monument and symbol of the Paleo-Christian time because it's believed that on the grounds there was a palace back in the 4th century in which the Edict of Milan was signed that legalized the Catholic Church. There are other aspects of the church that date back to the 17th and 18th century. There's been extensive reconstruction over the many years. At the end of the north aisle is the entrance to the Bramante Portico and the Court of the Oratory. This fine golden Carolinian altar frontal of the 9th century forms the high altar, and up towering above on the ceiling, you'll find frescoes from the 17th and 18th century. This basilica, despite its reconstructions, is basically the same building which witnessed the coronation of Charlemagne, the Holy Roman Emperor, and has received the earthly remains of numerous Christian martyrs. The stately interior was ahead of its time in the use of what would later be common Romanesque elements, especially in Lombard architecture, such as vaulted bays, a raised choir, and the alternation of heavy and light piers down the nave, pilaster strips and corbelled gables, and the nearby cloisters further highlight the architectural features of this great church of San Ambrogio. Bramante himself was called in to design these cloisters. There's two large quadrangles, one in the Doric style, the other in the Ionic style, and today it houses the Catholic University of Milan. So here we have the youngest cultural treasures of the city combined right next door to the most ancient of all monuments. The level of education in Italy is extremely high. Literacy is close to 100%, and Milan itself is the center of engineering and technology, as well as fashion and design for all of Italy. And here's where they get their training. They'll park their scooters and cars right out front of the cloisters, another clash with the ancient and the modern. And it's the end of our visit to San Ambrogio. We're walking to the corner to find a taxi to take us back to the main Duomo Piazza where we'll have our final glimpses of the city as we make our departure and head for Point South. The mass transit system in Milan is quite outstanding. There's buses, there's trolleys, there's a subway system, there's a commuter railroad system, taxis, people ride bicycles and scooters, as well as the private automobile. And surprisingly, the automobile congestion in the center of town is not bad at all. Another one of these fast food cafeterias that we saw earlier in the program. Final view of the Duomo Cathedral, again dating back to the 14th century. And we go into the subway that's going to take us five stops away to the main central train station, where we'll be boarding our train and heading for the Italian Riviera.
The subway system is quite modern in Milan, very clean, very easy to use. It's well marked, you just take a look on the map to see where you are and where you're going, find the proper subway line, and get on the train and go. It takes about 10 minutes to get from the Duomo to the central station. So even if you're passing through Milan for the day, as we've been doing on our trip here with Hawaii Geographic Society, you can see a lot of the city. Just go by subway, go by taxi, do some walking. And in six hours, you really can see the highlights of Milan as we have accomplished on this little mini visit to the city. Back into the main train station. This is the second largest train station in all of Europe. You can leave your suitcases in the baggage storage room for the day as we've done here. It only costs about $3 per bag and they'll take care of it for you and you go pick it up at the end of the day when you're ready to resume your journey. Here's our 15 suitcases. It sure beats carrying your luggage around the city while you're touring. It's a very efficient baggage service that you'll find in nearly all the train stations of Europe. And while you don't find very many porters in the train stations, you can increasingly find the baggage push cart, so you don't have to carry your suitcase through the station necessarily. But be prepared with a nice medium-sized suitcase that's got its own wheels, because very often there's no porters and no push carts. Now we're walking down our platform to our train that's going to take us south to Portofino.